Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hello, my name's Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you doing, Ken? Exceptionally well, Rory, and delighted to be here. Thank you for joining us for the Counselling Tutor podcast. This is episode 115, and a really good uh, episode today. We're going to be kicking off speaking about valuing yourself as a professional, a real interesting topic, and then moving on to growing as a therapist. Now, I assume we're not going to be watering ourselves or sitting on racks and pulling ourselves. Rory, what do you mean by growing as a therapist? Well, I think it's interesting. There's no watering cans or medieval torture <laughs> devices involved in this. But sometimes, sometimes it can feel like a balance of, of nurturing yourself and developing yourself. And, you know, sometimes a little bit of a painful growth as you grow out maybe of your base therapy and start to integrate other ideas. And I'm going to be talking about what you need to think about to grow as a therapist and, you know, what that could look like. Looking forward to that one. So that's in Practice Matters and we're ending episode 115 speaking about the topic of how we can fill the time between training. So if you're a student and you're on a formal training course, you come to an academic break, what can you be doing during that academic break? Of course, besides a little bit of self-care and putting the feet up, but if you want to use that time productively. And I guess also that can apply to our qualified colleagues of how you might use time in between uh, your CPD sessions for your ongoing continuous development as a professional counsellor but let's kick it off valuing yourself as a professional Rory and I do hear quite often uh, that sometimes particularly students who have just graduated or are about to graduate or going into placement can slightly undervalue what they have to offer. Yeah absolutely and sometimes some of the placements can undervalue people. I've heard stories of, of, of you know placement therapists being asked to clean toilets and hoover the floor and that type of thing like you'd ask a trainee psychiatrist to do that or a trainee doctor or a trainee dentist and um, you know what I would what I would say is that I hear I hear a lot from students and certainly through supervision through the years where people say oh, I'm just a trainee the, the, the mindset to have I think is that to your client you're their counselor I used to say this when I taught again and again and again you know, people who people who have uh, enrolled on counselling courses and got to practice level have earned the seat or should have earned the seat. And when they're in front of a client, they are the client's counsellor. Yes, they're in training. Yes, there's a lot of work to do, as there is for all professionals who, who grow and develop in their practice. But you, the mindset should be you're the, you are the client's counsellor because the client will see you as their counsellor, they won't say, oh, I've seen a trainee or, oh, um, this person's just in college. It'll be, I've been to see my counsellor. And that is what the reality of it, I think, Ken. A hundred percent. And, and you know, the, the topic is valuing yourself as a professional. And, and even as a qualified counsellor, uh, sometimes we undervalue who we are and what it is that we have to offer. And that is kind of sometimes seen in going into private practice, asking for money, feeling shy to ask for money. And at the end of the day, this is a professional qualification that you're doing uh, to become a counsellor. You're invest investing a lot of your time, your effort, your resources, your money. And, and it is so different to other courses in that it's not just about the, the work that you will do at the learning institution. There, there are practice hours of you, that you spoke about, Rory, there of having to go into placement and you're earning your place to be there and I think that there is something in putting your shoulders back and standing proud for the professional that you are whether you're just going into placement or whether you're coming out and you're going into to your own private practice and for the work that you put in you deserve to be paid for that I understand that as professionals that we are maybe serving a, uh, a client group that uh, can at, at some level be in difficulty or going through a hard time uh, but uh, at the same time, you are bringing a professional skill to that relationship um, and you deserve to be compensated for the studies you've done, the training you've done, that you have done and the professional that you are. Absolutely. And, and I know there's lots of voices within the profession who heartily are getting sick and tired of people posting and adverts for volunteer qualified counsellors. You know, like you would post well, wanted volunteer psychiatrist, volunteer heart surgeon, you know, 
Um, and I think that, you know, as, as therapists, we need to say, no, you know, we've, we have, we're qualified people. We've invested a lot of money in our training. And if you want us, you flip your well pay for us. And also, I think that cascades down to um, the level of uh, where people go into their placements. Placements should be um, very grateful that they have a, a group, a cohort of, of people right at the pinnacle of their training, not people who have qualified a few years ago, people who are learning the latest stuff, who are getting the latest information. In fact, when I interviewed Tim Bond, um, you know, quite recently, who wrote Standard and Ethics in Counseling, he actually said, and I quote, I'd be happy to be counseled by a trainee because they're probably going to be more attentive and probably going to be right at the peak of their learning. So, yeah, there is, there is something about valuing um, yourself. And I just want to share just a little story. Many years ago when I was training um, counsellors, um, I was talking to a level four uh, student, and she said, can I have a word with you, Roy? And I said, yes, of course. And she said to me, I had to phone the GP up to make a referral, and the GP, the, the doctor, treated me like a, a fellow professional. Mm. And I said, well, why wouldn't they? Yes. Why wouldn't they? And that's been my experience. If I've had to, uh, to speak with other professionals, it's been a cordial, concordant um, dialogue between two professional people. You know, and counselling is a profession. And I think that um, everybody, um, you know, and, and I, I am talking everybody, so take of that what you want, should realise that people invest their time and their money to help people. Mental health is a big issue in not just in the UK, but in the world. And the people who help people with mental health difficulties or emotional difficulties should be seen as professionals. So that's my mini diatribe over, Ken. <laughs> mm, and and I, I think that that story is echoed many times over. And we certainly hear that, that not the story itself, but the tone of that story of undervaluing ourselves. And, and that's the topic, valuing yourself. And I think there's an, an, a, an element of ownership here that we need to own who we are, what we do, the difference that it is making. And firstly, see ourselves as the professionals that we are in order to be seen by others. And there may be those that are uh, uninformed of what counselling is. I know before I started training, I had no idea what a counsellor was. Uh, and one of the first things I le learnt in level two is definition of what a counsellor is. And it took me quite by surprise at what it was. And I can look at my own placement when I was working in a GP surgery. Uh, it was the first time that they had counselling within the surgery. And even the GPs didn't have a full understanding of what counselling was. They shared with me that on their training course, only a very tiny part, maybe uh, an hour of the time in all of the years, was dedicated to what counselling was. So people may not understand what it is, who we are and what it is that we do, but we need to understand it first so that we can, again, stand with our shoulders back upright and be proud as the professionals that we are. We need to take ownership, I guess. Absolutely. And in some cases, it can literally be a matter of life and death. You know, I think that I think that that's forgotten. You know, if we have clients who are considering ending their lives and, you know, they're, they're in a, a position where they can't see the reason for going on living, a, a really good therapist, a caring person listening to that and hearing that can really make the difference between someone someone deciding to to take take their life and move it forward and live their life and look at the difficulties and sadly ending it and um you know I, I i know from my experience and experience of other therapists this happens more regularly than uh, we'd like to think about i guess from 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 a personal point the the people whose lives you make the biggest differences in as a counsellor, you maybe don't get to hear that. In so many jobs, you're told what a great job you did uh, when you're the heart surgeon and, you, and you, you, you're doing all that kind of work. You're constantly being told what a great job you're doing and what a difference that is making. And very often with the people that we work with, we never see them again. The big difference that happens for them is in their lives post-therapy, they've had a change, they go out and they're better able to cope. So we're not getting that constant feedback. So we need to look within ourselves, realise what we're doing, the value of what we're doing uh, and and be confident 
in that. What what a topic, what a topic. And I challenge those listening, what are you doing to value yourself as a professional? And of course, Rory, it just brings us so beautifully onto Practice Matters and the next topic, because we're speaking about growing as a therapist. And, you know, there's the, the, there is an ethical obligation that we grow as, as a, a qualified therapist, but this kind of links into being a student as well, what you do with your downtime, uh, what you do if there's an academic break, how do we continue to grow as a therapist? Can you give us like a little bit of seasoning, salt and pepper of what we can expect in Practice Matters? I'll give you a soupçon, Ken, of, uh, of, <laughs> of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and maybe it's it's about, you know, a lot of people are very loyal to their, their meta modality. And sometimes the, the, the pain of that is that a lot of the modalities were taught in the 1950s. And we live in, you know, we live in the millennia. And we know more about neuroscience. We know more about trauma. And my challenge really in terms of growing as a therapist is that sometimes we have to develop and build upon the modality we're taught and not be purist. Oh, it's already challenging me. I can feel my purist person-centered uh, hairs tingling on the back of my neck as you say that, Rory. So let's get into practice matters with Rory after this very short message. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. I've always believed that the client guides our path. As therapists, where they go, we follow. Most paths have forks where you may need to take a detour. These usually appear when, as professionals, we meet clients who challenge our primary model of therapy or we struggle to enter the client's frame of reference. My first fork in the road came about when I first practised as a school counsellor. For a long time, I believed and bought into the purity of my approach. It soon became apparent that I needed to expand my knowledge of the client group and my therapeutic interventions, so I enrolled in a child and adolescent therapy course. A year or so later, another fork in the road appeared, that of working with grief, so I took a loss and bereavement course. Through the years, I've taken quite a few detours from the path I started on. The most recent was attending a course on neurobiology and trauma. In my supervision sessions, I would reflect that some of the details felt like betraying the clear, pure path I started on. It felt, quite frankly, uncomfortable. Then one day, while out walking in the hills near where I live, I found myself taking a different route to my favourite tea room, and it felt very unfamiliar, a little rocky, and quite unsafe underfoot. At the end of this path, I realised that my detour had got me to my favourite tea room safe and sound. So I consider my additional learning like my walking gear, which comprises of sturdy boots, warm socks, a water-resistant coat and my trusty jeep cap and a small compass to keep me heading in the right direction. Therapeutically, I still walk the same person's centred path. I am now just better equipped if the client wants to take a detour onto unfamiliar or rocky terrain. Thank you as always, Rory. Truly informative. And uh, I guess with the academic break upon us, some some uh, some food for thought for those of us who uh, may be putting our feet up. And uh, as always, you can get Rory's super duper handout from Practice Matters. And it's free. All you need to do is go to our website, which is counsellingtutor.com. That's two L's in the word counselling, because we are based in the United Kingdom. Counsellingtutor.com. Uh, click on the podcast tab, which you'll find at the very top of the page go to episode 115 that's 115 that's today's episode everything we've spoken about is precede on that page we call it our show notes so you can kind of get a bite size uh, get all the information we've spoken about in one bite as well as any links to external resources that we may find that link into today's topic and you can download Rory's handout free of charge from within the page by just popping in your name and your email address and we will send that directly to your inbox and of course if you're one of our valued members of our paid for resource which is called the counselor's resource counseling study resource then uh, just log in it is there waiting for you in your handouts vault moving on and we're going to be uh, ending episode 115 today on the topic of how to fill your time between your training courses 
Absolutely. And uh, one of the things, certainly in the UK, is usually the, the courses go by academic year. So what happens is you finish your level two. Now, level twos are usually 10-week courses here in the UK. And if you, if you start your 10-week course in September, you're usually done and dusted by Christmas, which means you've got a whole, whole kind of eight months to wait until the course starts again. You, you go on to the level three. And if you've done a level three and you're going on to level four, um, the same thing applies, really. You, you've got you've got the, the summer break to kind of uh, traverse, if that's the word, um, before you start. And a lot of students in the past have, have contacted me and said, what can I do uh, in the break? How can I keep up? And basically, um, my view would be to try and think about the kind of things you may be asked in, in the next course. You've covered those topics to um, most most courses are structured they're like a building block a scaffold if you like so you start off with level two and you cover theories in a very basic level and then a level three you go into a little bit deeper and level four you go into them deeper still and you're asked to apply them to yourself as well as your your clients when you're practicing so you could start off by looking at what you've studied and try to gain more information so usually you study um, theory you study ethics, you study skills, and you study personal development. So you could start off by just making a list, and I'm going to study a little bit more about the theory I've been taught. It's usually in the UK person-centered theory, but you could look at transactional analysis. You could look at cognitive behavioral therapy. You could look at Freud if you if you want to um, have a very deep dive. And you could get some ideas and study and there's no better place to, to get that information than from our website, counsellingtutor.com, because we have a lot of the modalities on the site. You just go into the site, drop down, and you can find lots of information um, about the kind of modes, modalities that you're going to be studying. Um, really, really useful. And, of course, it's really useful for if you're doing interviews. If you're going for an interview for your next course, if you can evidence that you've done some study, then that will always put you in a good light, speaking as an ex-tutor. Yeah, tell, <laughs> tell me about it. It does. It really, really works. And we get that feedback all the time from uh, from fellow students on our Facebook group. And, of course, if uh, well, that's something you can do. If, if you're not a member of the Counselling Tutor Facebook group, that's a way you can fill your uh, time uh, in between training courses. Come and join because there are uh, tens of thousands of like-minded students, qualified counsellors, tutors, supervisors who hang out on the Counselling Tutor Facebook page. And we have discussions all the time on the topic of counselling uh, and you can find our Facebook group by just going to Facebook and typing in counselling tutor it really is as simple as that it's a closed group because it's for counsellors and psychotherapists so just knock on the door uh, let us know who you are and we will open it and warmly welcome you in but you're 100% right Rory and you're talking about uh, that spending your time how to use your time revisiting the theories and I think that this extends beyond training I really do you know that Carl Rogers mentions uh, that uh, 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 he speaks about a way of being as as a counsellor. It is a way of being. It's less about what you do, what you know. It is a way of being. And being a counsellor for me is about a way of being. It is a lifestyle. It's about submerging yourself uh, into that lifestyle. And what can you do to do that? Well, you can listen to the Counselling Tutor podcast. You're doing that right now. That is submerging yourself. You may be driving your car. You may be having a jog. You may be formally sitting down listening to this. However you choose to consume it, You've got information coming your way. You're hearing trigger words. You're hearing topics around counselling, and it is it is it is uh, I guess increasing your awareness as a practitioner. Reading uh, industry uh, publications like the BACP release a reg regular publication. Just reading through it, paging through it. You're not formally studying, but you're submerging yourself, soaking yourself in the material. And as you said, Rory, uh, counselling tutor podcast absolutely brimming. Uh, with great uh, content and if you have uh, become a member of our paid for resource the counseling study resource well firstly thank you we value you but also just bob into the counseling study resource there are over 60 hours of cpd linked lectures where you can pop on a lecture revisit a topic have a look at a new topic educate yourself and kind of again just steep yourself in the the theory in the practice uh, listen to some skills, 
Absolutely. And also, I think there's, there's some value in familiarisation. There's nothing worse than sitting in the class and having a whole load of vocabulary thrust upon you that you think, well, interjected values, injunctions and drivers, uh, automatic negative thoughts, you know, they're new ideas. And if you're engaging with them for the first time, you can get mind block, you can get um, overload. But if you've already engaged with that, if you've already done some study and these terms are familiar to you, then you don't have to worry about kind of the shock of the new vocabulary. You can just then develop on what you know. You can just fill the gaps in using your study to develop and enhance and expand your knowledge. So that's another really good reason. If I go to any CPD course, um, I will do my reading first. I will do my study first before I engage in it, because then I've got um, an overview of it, and then I can take the, the meat and potatoes of the training and really engage with it, as opposed to getting stuck with what does this word mean and what does that word mean. Mm. And you do you do hear it. I've been to courses where people say, can you tell me what polyvagal means? Mm. Or can you tell me what um, the amygdala is? And, you know, that's fine. But if you know that before you go, then all you have to do then is just is just to is just to fill the gaps of your knowledge in. So really useful, and there's so much out there. Certainly, um, as Ken said on the, on the Counselling Tutor Facebook page, loads of stuff in there. Mm. So I, I just want to mention here as we kind of come to the end of episode 115, we've mentioned kind of. Uh, what you can do in between your counselling training uh, course, how you can enrich yourself. We've 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 sp- spoke about growing as a helper. So there's a lot of learning there and steeping yourself in that uh, knowledge, as it were. I'm, I'm seeing myself being dipped in the vat of knowledge here, Rory. I've got a picture, a metaphor uh, playing out. In- <laughs> it's not really a metaphor, is it? This this, this very uh, this picture and and Rory. Uh, to, to kind of let the cat at least peek out of the bag, although not the cat directly out of the bag. I know that you have been working extensively on this topic, looking at the, the upcoming academic break. Uh, if you're listening to this in real time, we're about to hit the academic break here in the UK, and it's the biggie, it's the big summer holiday for our counselling study resource members. And you're speaking about like a, a summary school type of thing that where we might put on events and a lot more... Um, stuff that people can kind of engage with over that time to to bridge that gap and to keep in touch because there's nothing worse I guess than cutting it all off going you know what I'm not going to look at that now for the next three to six weeks and then going back to it again and everything is kind of it's almost like starting the car again from a cold engine as opposed to keeping it running in the background on on a uh, a, a less with with less commitments of having deadlines and assignments and reports to put in. Absolutely. Well, without letting the entire cat out of the bag on that, feline, that, feline, that feline metaphor, <laughs> not that not that anybody at Counselling Tutor keeps cats in bags, just to be clear on that. We don't want the we don't want the the, the complaints will be pouring in, Rory. <laughs> you know, don't put cats in bags is the message here. Um, but to but to give you a little peek, um, we're going to be running a summer school. One of the wonderful things about being a former lecturer of counselling, both myself and Ken, is that we absolutely know the kind of things that students want to get involved in um, through through the through the, the, the quite a large in the UK academic break. And we're going to be running a summer school of really key um, really key topics that students of all levels who are progressing on. Uh, really need to know before they engage in their courses. So the the super turned on students will be tuning into that, and they'll be they'll be getting all that knowledge, like Ken and myself do, before we go to CPD. So that when we sit in the class, we're not concerned, we're not anxious, we're not caught in the headlights. We've got a good underpin uh, to go forward and to really get that information and make the most of our studies. Love it. What an episode full of in, in, enrichment, I guess, today. This has been episode 115. Rory, speak us through what we've learned today. Yes, well, we, we talked about right at the beginning, value yourself as a professional and um, hold your head up high. In Practice Matters, I've talked about growing pains and moving forward, maybe from the modality of your therapy. And um, finally, we looked at uh, filling the time between courses, keeping your knowledge high, so that, again, when you go into your classes, you can feel super confident and really ready to rock and roll. And, uh, hey, as always, 
stay grounded and stay safe. Take care. Take the stress out of your counselling studies and get the support of Rory and I by joining us in the Counselling Study Resource. Counselling Study Resource, or CSR for short, is the world's most comprehensive assignment guidance and study support resource for students just like you of counselling and psychotherapy. See how Counselling Study Resource can help you. Visit counsellingtutor.com. That's counsellingtutor.com. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counsellingtutor.com. Dot